Hi guys. Today we're going to start with classification of animals day one with our speaking and listening. During speaking and listening, you have a goal or a job to do. Today I want you to be focused on defining and determining the author's point of view about animal classification. You're going to see some core vocabulary words that we're going to be using in this lesson. We're going to look at these words before we actually start. You're not expected to know these words immediately, but with repeated exposure throughout lessons, hopefully you get a good understanding of most of the words. You can keep a unit dictionary notebook along with definitions, sentences, and other writing exercises after using these vocabulary words. So let's look at those words. The first word is characteristics. Characteristics are something that makes a person, thing, or group different. To classify means to put things into groups based on similarities or types. Invertebrates are animals that do not have a backbone. A kingdom is a major group into which all living things are classified. And invertebrates are animals that do have backbones. So listen to the story today to see if you can hear those words. We're going to be focusing, remember, on the author's point of view. When we focus on this, we need to ask ourselves a couple of questions. Why did the author write the text or passage? And does the author want to answer, explain, or describe a topic? Okay, the author does one of those three things. Take out your skills book and turn to page 2.2. You're going to be kind of listening as we go through and kind of getting an idea on page 2.2 about the author's purpose. I'm going to read it to you real quick before we actually start today's lesson. In the 1700s, zoologist Carolus Linnaeus made a big leap for science. He set up an animal classification system. He grouped animals with similar features together. He depended mainly on human observation to do this. He did not have the tools we have now. Today, scientists use special technologies to find hidden similarities among animals. For example, they found that chimpanzees are more closely related to us than they are to gorillas. In fact, we and the chimps share an ape ancestor that lived millions of years ago. Chimps are part of a group called the Great African Apes. Gorillas, bonobos, and orangutans are part of this group too. Linnaeus point, uh, placed these apes in one group and us in a different one, all by ourselves. However, new research has changed things. The Great African Apes have joined us as part of one family, the hominids. This was a big leap for science. As science continues to advance, the way we classify all the world's animals will continue to change too. So, let's ask ourselves, why did the author write this passage? Did the author write this to answer a question, explain something, or to describe a topic? I believe the author has written this to explain to us how animals are classified, in particular chimps. Now, is the author trying to explain, answer, or describe? Explain your answer. In the text, it gives us many details about why animals are classified and how they're classified. It even talks about the tools that are used to help make these classifications. You can hold on to 2.2 for us. Let's get back to today's read aloud. In today's read aloud, you're gonna hear about five groups of animals and that they, you should listen to find out the names of these animal groups and why scientists group them as you, they do. We will also focus on the point of view of the author. We'll be pausing during the text 
to analyze a short passage to determine the author's point of view. So let's get started. Aha, I'm back. Does anyone remember me? It's me, Ranborough, animal expert and world traveler. We've explored lots of animal habitats together, haven't we? From hot savannas to cold Arctic regions, we've watched hungry carnivores eat their prey with very sharp teeth while herbivores feast on grasses nearby. Today, I've got great fun in store for you. I'm going to present a slideshow. But before I do that, I'd like to tell you a little about how scientists understand animals. Think about all of the different types of animals on Earth. Grasshoppers, penguins, rabbits, lions, salmon, turtles, and salamanders are just a few. What other animals can you name? Wow, you know lots of animals. How do you tell them apart? How do you recognize or identify them? One way that we make sense of our world is by sorting things into categories or groups. Look closely at these pictures of a salamander and a squirrel and notice their characteristics. Can you name any ways that a salamander and a squirrel are alike? How are they different? What other characteristics can you think of to help us sort animals into categories? So let's discuss the point of view. Now, if we think about it, as you listen to this paragraph, you can complete the back side of page 2.2. You'll think about why did the author write the passage, and did the author want to explain, answer, or describe a topic? I'll give you a moment to answer why did the author write that passage. Okay. Let's continue with our read aloud. In the mid-1700s, about 250 years ago, a Swedish man named Carolus Linnaeus became fascinated by the many different ways that people all over the world were grouping animals. Some people grouped animals by how they looked. Others grouped them by their habits, and still others by where animals lived. It was all a great mumbo-jumbo. So Linnaeus decided to use their ideas to create a worldwide system to classify or group animals based on their shared characteristics. This science of classifying organisms is called taxonomy. Using new ideas and tools, scientists have continued to study organisms in the ways they are similar and different. Over time, ideas about how to classify animals have changed somewhat. Scientists currently recognize three groups of living organisms based on important parts within their cells. Scientists generally agree that these groups of organisms are then divided into kingdoms, the main groups into which all living things have been further classified. Plants and animals are the two kingdoms that I know the most about, and today I'm here to talk to you about my favorite one. That's right, the animal kingdom. Taxonomists identify animals by their characteristics or special features that set them apart from others. They divide the five animal kingdoms into smaller and smaller groups, with each smaller group having more and more in common with one another. Each group has a specific name. For example, you and I not only belong to the same kingdom, the animal kingdom, but we both belong to the same phylum, the phylum known as chordata, because we share similar body characteristics. Most animals in the phylum chordata are vertebrates. A vertebrate has a backbone. Do you have a backbone? Yes, you do, and so do I. That is one of our common characteristics. One of the ways that scientists group us to show relationships between us. 
my backbone is smaller than yours because I'm much smaller. But if you look closely at this image, you can see how similar the bones are. Vertebrates belong to the animal kingdom and are in the phylum chordata. This phylum is divided into even more groups called classes. A class is divided into smaller groups called orders. An order is divided into smaller groups called families. A family is divided into smaller groups, each called genus. And a genus is divided into even smaller groups called species. There are many, many species within each group. Now that you know that a vertebrate is an animal with a backbone, what do you think an invertebrate is? Yes, that's correct. An invertebrate is an animal with no backbone. A little more than 95% of all animals on Earth are invertebrates. Think about it. More than 95% of all the species of animals on Earth are invertebrates. That's a lot, and most of them are fairly small. Fewer than 5% of all animal species are vertebrates. That means that you and I and all vertebrates belong to a very small percentage of all the animals on Earth. Mammals, that includes all humans, are literally just a speck. Now that you've heard a little about how taxonomists sort animals into categories, I'm ready to begin the slideshow of my worldwide travels. And I'm going to teach you all kinds of amazing things about animals. I met the most wonderful new animal friends while I traveled the globe. And so, throughout this domain, I will show you my slides so that you can meet them. They represent five vertebrate groups of animals. As they are introduced, remember to think about how a scientist might classify each one of my new friends. How is each one like you, and how is each one different from you? Here's Paula, piranha from Colombia. This is Tabitha Toad. Here's Tabitha Toad. From Brazil. Here's Anna the Anaconda from Peru. Here's Ebenezer Egret from South Africa. And meet Hilda Hippo from Tanzania. Please welcome Paula, Tabitha, Anna, Ebenezer, and Hilda to your classroom. They are going to appear from time to time in my slides as you learn about the five vertebrate groups of animals. Be sure to keep a sharp eye out for them. You never know when one of them might turn up. Aren't they a handsome bunch? They all belong to the animal kingdom, like you and me, and they are like us in another way. They all have backbones. Now, things get tricky. We are all animals and we're all vertebrates, but we are not all the same, are we? Heavens no. We have lots of differences as well. You and I belong to the class or group called mammals. What makes mammals different from other classes of animals is that they have fur or hair, and their mothers give birth to live babies and feed their babies with the milk their bodies produce. You will learn more about these and other characteristics of mammals another day. My friend Hilda Hippo is indeed a mammal, even though it is hard to see the little bit of hair around her mouth and on the tips of her ears and tail. When I was in Tanzania, Hilda and I had a visit with a proud new mother hippopotamus. Look at her with her baby. So, I'm a mammal, you're a mammal, and Hilda is a mammal. But my other friends have different classifications. One of them is in the reptile class, a scaly creature that likes to warm itself in the sunshine. Anna Anaconda. Isn't she beautiful? She's one of the largest snakes in the world. Though she is not poisonous, her strong muscles help her constrict or squeeze her prey. Another of my friends is an amphibian 
which means that she lays eggs and lives both in and out of water. Most animals in the amphibian class have smooth, wet skin, but my friend's skin is rather dry and leathery. Who is she? Right again, Tabitha Toad. She looks a lot like her close relative, the frog, doesn't she? Her skin helps protect her as it's camouflaged or able to blend into the environment. My last two friends should be easy to classify because their classification names are much more common to all of us. Which one of my friends is a member of the bird class? Yes, Ebenezer Egret. Ebenezer is a warm-blooded vertebrate with feathers. Paula Piranha is the last of my friends to be classified today. Which group does Paula belong to? Paula Piranha is a fish. He has fins and gills and lives in water. Piranhas, though small, are thought by many to be dangerous because of their very sharp teeth. Don't worry, Paula likes many other piranhas, usually feeds on dead and injured wild animals. Taxonomists believe that all of the vertebrate animals on Earth can be classified into one of these five animal groups. Fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. In the fish group, there are three different fish classes. Fish also have the largest number of species among vertebrates. Even though there are more than 60,000 known species of vertebrates on Earth, there are nearly a million and a half invertebrates, and a million of those are insects. Scientists continue to discover thousands of new insect species each year. How can this be? It's because there are still unexplored areas of the Earth, far into the rainforest, inside the cold ice of glaciers, within the hot lava of volcanoes, and deep down in the ocean. Perhaps one day you will discover new animals yourselves. Examine and classify them by different characteristics and add to our, our understanding of taxonomy. So let's think about what you've learned today. Scientists classify organisms, including animals, in order to show relationships between them. Animals are classified by common characteristics. Vertebrate animals have backbones, whereas invertebrates do not. Some are warm-blooded, whereas others are cold-blooded. We will learn more about warm-blooded and cold-blooded animals in other readings and read-alouds. So let's think about other ways that scientists might classify animals. It is important to consider where animals live, their habitats. Do they live in water or on land? Do they live in warm climates or cold climates? What covers their bodies? Feathers or scales, fur or hair? Do they lay eggs or do they give birth to live creatures that look like smaller versions of themselves? What kinds of food do they eat? Plants, animals, or both? These are all important questions for taxonomists to ask as they work to group animals into categories that are easily studied. In the upcoming read-alouds, you will learn much more, much more about how animals are classified. Next time, we will pick up with the slideshow so that I can teach you about the groups of animals to which Tabitha Toad, Anna Anaconda, and Paola Piranha belong. Can anyone make a prediction? about which of my friends are warm-blooded animals like me? Well, you'll have to wait until next time to see if you're right. Now, you're gonna answer a few questions for us. While this happens, remember you may have to pause the video and rewatch part of it. Hope you guys do well.